Good afternoon. Welcome to Coronavirus and Our Mental Health. I'm Ken Burtness, and I'm coming to you from Holly Eva on the North Shore. Today is July 6th, and we're two days past our country's birthday, um, our country's 246th birthday. So I hope you had a good time celebrating uh, this weekend at a safe time. Uh, let's talk about coronavirus. Let's start with there an update of that. Uh, I get my information always from the New York Times and the Department of Health, and these are from the New York Times as of yesterday, July 5th. Now, what we're seeing is uh, the country is experiencing a little uptick, and uh, we're experiencing a small decrease, which sounds good, but the problem is that uh, we've been one of the most surging places in the country for the past month. So. Uh, we still have a ways to go. Uh, a month ago, we were number one, as a matter of fact, uh, and then we went down two weeks ago, and this time uh, we're still above average as far as the states and our neighbors go. Uh, <clears throat> the, the honors go to, uh, as far as being the surgingest places, is Puerto Rico, American Samoa, and Louisiana. So if you have friends there, you should uh, call them up or email them and wish them well, because uh, I know they're going through a tough time. Now, what we're looking at, if we look back, uh, let's start at the beginning of the year. The beginning of the year, we had that big surge from Omicron, and we're far below that, thank goodness. Now, but the problem is uh, our lows, which occurred in April, we're still significantly above that. So we're not out of the woods. This is not the end of the pandemic. Uh, Coronavirus is still alive and well, unfortunately. And the way we're treating it is, you know, we're going out and celebrating this past weekend and uh, very few people using masks. And we're all not social distancing and we're all celebrating together. Uh, and this is very soon to do this. We still, other people are worried. I'm worried. Um, and I think the Department of Health and maybe the people up at, uh, in the national and the capital are, are still worried as well. We still have that potential and we still don't know what new variants are out there. So we have to be uh, really careful. Now, what we've been doing on this program is uh, after we really explored coronavirus in the first number of sessions, uh, we've been trying to deal with the negativity that all of us are living in. <clears throat> not only from the negativity, not only from the coronavirus, but from the war that's going on, the climate change, the mass shootings. Every time you turn on the news, there's something real negative and something to cause you not to smile, to be honest. Uh, and smiling is hard nowadays. So we're focusing on the positives. So that's what we're going to continue to do. And especially today, we're going to talk about uh, <clears throat> how to think more positively, how to feel more positively, and how to change our behavior more positively. And luckily, I have my good friend, Jeremy McCood here. Uh, he's going to take us into a positive area by talking about the joy of cooking. Jeremy, welcome to the show. It's great having you here. Thanks, Ken. I'm, I'm so uh, thrilled to be invited to do this. <laughs> now, <clears throat> during the pandemic, a lot of people were turning to, well, they were staying away from restaurants, and they were cooking at home. And Lo and behold, a lot of people were really enjoying it. So I was hoping we could start the show with you <clears throat> sharing some of your secrets of how to cook wonderfully at home and uh, cook well at home. Yeah, we, um, you know, not just the, the home cooking uh, boom, but there was also people that were starting their own gardens, oh, great. their own vegetables. And, you know, we had a really big kind of surge towards um, uh, sustainable, uh, sustainable agriculture for, for, you know, but on a, on a whole home size. Uh -huh. So, so yeah, we really enjoyed it. Um, it. Cooking at home, you know, it's, it's, you can have so much fun with it. It shouldn't be something that like, I don't consider it a chore to cook at home. I really enjoy providing, you know, yummy things for my family to eat. And, you know, and for me, like the, the, the process is the is the fun part is you know enjoy 
the the whole thing you know cutting your vegetables cutting your meat cutting you know chopping things and getting things prepared uh, having uh, you know having good quality ingredients as fresh as you can afford or as fresh as you can get um you know seasoning things simply salt and pepper uh you know fresh food will 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 provide its own wonderful flavor so you know if you if you want to add a little bit of this and a little bit of that that's nice but the fresh food is going to provide you a lot of the flavor that you're looking for um sharp knives sharp knives very important <laughs> um so with cooking so in the restaurants, they have a they have a thing called mise en place, which is everything in its place, and that usually means you have you have your items chopped all ready to go, so that when you're actually cooking, you're just focusing on heating the pan and the lovely sizzle of the stuff that you're that you're putting together and smells and your little glass of Chardonnay on the side, if that's your thing. <laughs> but uh, it's enjoying the process. And, and a lot of times I think we get, we get involved in like, okay, I have to do this and I have to cook this and I have to, you know, yeah, we have to provide sustenance for our families, but, you know, take that extra five minutes to just kind of enjoy what you're doing, you know, savor the, the process if you can. Um, that's, for me, that's, that's my that's where I gain my joy of cooking. And that's, you know, it, it, it's, it's engrossing myself in it. Yeah. I, I have to share something, Jeremy, uh, <clears throat> with the folks at home. The first time that uh, I asked Jeremy to cook at my place when he was over there, I uh, imposed upon him. And he took a look around my kitchen and he looked at my knives and he said, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but amazingly, he had brought some sharpening tools along, which I was, you know, and uh, sharpened my knives for me, which I was forever grateful for. And I now have been much more attentive to keeping them uh, sharp. So that was, uh, <clears throat> yeah, that we, was, got you all, was we, we got you all hooked up. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, every time I cook for Ken, it's always kind of an adventure because we can uh, Ken will, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping, eventually get back into doing his annual uh, Thanksgiving. Uh, you know, we have a big party at his house for Thanksgiving, and I get the privilege of cooking breakfast for the crew that comes and digs the emu and preps the, the we do a big emu, uh, Ken does a big emu with the, the turkeys and the um, yabi wood and the, the, the river stones, and it's just, it's such, it's a, it's a, it's a, the ritual of doing that. That's so much fun. And I get to come and I get to cook breakfast for all of the people that come and do uh, the hard work. And uh, it's nice. We all, you know, the, they finish the jobs. We all get together and we all just commune around this table with this wonderful breakfast and eggs and omelets and uh, Ken's favorite, uh, famous waffles. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm looking forward to us doing that again, Ken. I'm really, I'm really going to enjoy because I know we're we're coming towards the uh, the sunsetting of uh, of that tradition. Yeah, for sure. I I had uh, I had promised everybody that I would do 40 years. Uh, we started in uh, 1982 when Hurricane Eva came through, and all of a sudden I had no power, no water, no anything. And luckily, my neighbor had taught me how to emu turkey. Uh, actually not turkey, he emu'd a pig about uh, two months before, and, and I watched and learned a little bit about emuing. And so start in 1982, we started doing this, and so I always thought that I would probably retire after 40 years. We got to the pandemic, and that was in 2020, and of course, we couldn't have it and then, and we couldn't have it for uh, 2021. So I'm now holding at the 39th this, this year, if we can hold it which I certainly hope that we do, it'd be the 39th year. And then next year we can uh, say aloha to it, but it's, it's a lot of work. And, uh, you know, and people are working hard, especially in that morning, Thanksgiving morning, because they're digging the pit uh, and they're putting the fire rocks in and they got to do special uh, kiavi wood, you know, and there's, there's a lot of preparation for the turkeys itself to be put in the pit. So everybody's working hard in the morning and they were, 
used to my just sort of blah breakfasts, but when Jamie joined us, uh, <laughs> Jeremy joined us, uh, all of a sudden people's face lit up and, and the breakfast was huh? amazing. It was amazing and uh well, it's such I, an I honor to cook points. for everybody though <laughs> you know, i i find it an honor to be able to cook for all these people because i know they're out there busting their butts and uh they come up and they eat a good hearty breakfast and everybody just kind of passes out for a little while <laughs> <laughs> well i i can't thank you enough jeremy for all that uh it it was just a wonderful thing that you did for everybody uh getting back to uh you preparing food because i love that idea of the joy of just cooking, the uh, cooking those ingredients and uh, all, all our senses are sort of involved with cooking with a sense of smell and the sense of touch and taste, and, as well as uh, seeing and hearing. Uh, it's just a wonderful experience. The question I would have on that, though, is a lot of people aren't used to using raw environments or natural ingredients, not environments, but ingredients. Uh, and they're used to prepared food, preparing prepared food. Uh, any hints that you can give them if they're unused to doing a lot of chopping and, a, and uh, working with a lot of raw vegetables, for instance, or, or other ingredients? The, the fun thing about cooking is you can, you can experiment. And, you know, it's, it's not, there's no real wrong answer as far uh -huh. as, you know, if you're putting something together and, you know, I, and experimenting is how all these great fusion chefs came up with these, um, you know, these, these Japanese, Italian, or these uh, Moroccan, French, or, you know, the, the, you had to play. You had to come up with some, some stinkers before you come up with the really good uh, quality dishes. So, you know, experimenting and having fun with food is, you know, part of the joy that you get when you, when you get involved in it. And it's always, you know, for me, it, um, it, you do what you need to do to, to take care of your family. So if, if you come home and you've only got something that you have to put in the microwave and cook, that's okay. And you can, you know, you can throw spins on it to make things a little bit healthier. So yeah, you get the microwave pizza, but you know, you just put a nice salad together with that and you get your healthy along with your, uh, your indulgence. So <laughs> You know, and don't be afraid yeah. to try things because you, you you might come up with the next great culinary uh, uh, fusion. <laughs> yeah, and you know that's part of the coronavirus is we're sort of afraid to try things, and uh, those words of wisdom I think uh, hopefully resonate because that's uh, we can go out there and we can make mistakes, you know, and people will still love us even if we screw up on a couple of dishes. <laughs> exactly, and if you're having fun with it, then you know the. You know, there's that sort of saying, like, you can cook something that somebody else has cooked the exact same recipe, the exact same methodology, and it's not going to taste the same because the person that's putting, uh, the person that's putting their mana or their love or their aloha into the food that they're cooking, it's tangible. Yeah. I've made dishes that my grandmother used to make and mine don't taste nearly as good as hers because of the love that she put into the dishes. So, you know, when you cook, put your love, put your heart, put your mana into what you're doing. And the people, you know, the people that you're feeding will, will be just like, wow, I used to have this before, but it, you know, it's so much better. It's, it's, it's a tangible thing. Mana and aloha, man. I'm telling yeah, you. Yeah, exactly. You know, the exact same thing happened with me because, uh, my mother uh, never considered herself a good cook, but what she did cook was terrific. And, you know, after she passed, I tried to duplicate that stuff, just like you're saying with your grandmother. And I just could not, it just never tasted as good at all. Yeah, my, my, I felt the same way with my, with my mom. When she passed away, I'm like, ah, there's, there's some dishes that are gonna go with her because I don't remember how to cook them or I don't remember her special technique for getting the the fish just right or the the pork chops that she'd cook just right it's so you know i'm i strive all the time to try and be as good a home cook as she was uh, terrific uh let me ask you another question as a chef <clears throat> i know you've cooked in a lot of different places a lot of different venues <clears throat> and for a lot of different people uh can you share a little bit about uh 
those differences, you know, when you're the, the differences in experience uh, in these varieties of setting that you've been in. And I know you've been in a lot. Um, and, you know, with the settings come challenges, you know, if you, if I cook in your kitchen, I'm not going to have the same things that I'm going to have in my kitchen. If I'm cooking for someone who will only eat vegan, you know, I have, you have constraints on what you can and can't do, but whatever you do end up, or whatever you do end up preparing for the person, um, it's always sort of been, and I've got some ADHD and I think a lot of, a lot of cooks do have ADHD or I don't have the hyperactivity because I'm not, I'm not very fast, but um, <laughs> ADD and it's always been the instant gratification that I get from putting something together, constructing it on a plate and then presenting it to somebody and watching them put it in their mouth and just going, oh, that's so good. Or, oh, that brings back a memory of my mother or my grandmother or, you know what I mean? It, yeah. And so, and no matter who, what do you cook for famous people, whether you cook for you know, your family. As a chef, we, it's a struggle because we don't get invited to people's homes all that often mm -hmm. because nobody wants to cook for the chef because it's going to be critical or they're going to be, you know, they're going to be, you know, uh, judgmental about the food that I put. I, I'm thankful anytime someone cooks me a meal because I know what it takes. And I know the effort. I know the, the love that you have to put into the dish. So you could cook me beans on toast and I will be over the moon because somebody else is cooking it and, and they, <laughs> they're loving to it. And so, you know, so the, the gratification of seeing somebody enjoying the meal that I've made for them is, you know, cause chefs don't get paid very well. Mm -hmm. uh, that a lot of times just is, is what makes me smile and go home at the end of the night with a, with a happy feeling. Yeah. Uh, let me, You've cooked not only uh, in the U.S., but you've cooked in other countries as well. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience? Yeah, so, so I really started my, my culinary time being seriously uh, in uh, a restaurant and working as a, 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 a junior sous chef. It was in England, and everybody kind of has a real, uh, there's a stereotypical uh, everything is boiled or everything is, you know, mushy <laughs> or everything is, you know, uh, Britain has finally, I think, understood that they're surrounded in Europe by all of this amazing cuisine, you know, Italian, French, uh, uh, Portuguese, uh, uh, you know, so there, there's these wonderful uh, uh, resources for people to, to, to try different things. And a lot of the British chefs have adopted Italian cuisine or adopted French cuisine and all of these wonderful things. So the, the quality level of food in England has, and, and, and the rest of uh, Great Britain has, has, has just taken off. You have amazing Michelin star restaurants all over England now. Uh, wow. Not just and not just uh, Gordon Ramsay. Uh, there's some really quality chefs that uh, that you wouldn't think would be uh, 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 heading up a Michelin star restaurant. Mm -hmm. But you go in and the atmosphere is amazing and the food is just out of this world. So you know, don't don't count uh, Britain out for <laughs> quality food because they're 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 stepping up. Uh -huh. um, I, and I was lucky because I was sort of right on the cusp of when the, the British food revolution happened, uh, sort of a renaissance. Uh, and I got to work in some really amazing restaurants for some really amazing chefs. And they taught me how to do things like, uh, you know, making, making all of my things from scratch. We made gourmet ketchup from scratch. I loved it. Wow. Uh, you know, all kinds of things. We made our ice cream in-house. We did, you know, our beef came from a ranch that solely sourced our restaurant. And, you know, so we, we got a chance to work with some of them, some of the best ingredients. Wow. That sounds great. It was a lot of you fun. Know, you know, and uh, I was never a, a great, a good cook. Uh, but uh, the advantage I had was that I was a man when I was young and men never cooked. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Uh, it's a strange thing because so many of the world's great chefs are male. 
But if you look at the rank and file of who's cooking at home, it's usually the woman. So when I was in my 20s, uh, and my mother had taught me about cooking, and she said I had to know all the things to be, be able to survive and to take care of myself. Even if there was no woman around, I had to do the cleaning and the <clears throat> ironing and the laundry and cook. Uh, and I got lots of kudos from that from women because oftentimes I was the first male that had cooked for them. So uh, <clears throat> in my year, early years, we're in Southern California and uh, I love Mexican food. And, but uh, I stayed away from Mexican food. I thought, you know, there's no way because there's so many wonderful Mexican restaurants in Southern California. So I cooked Asian food <laughs> because there was not very many good Asian food restaurants. So I cooked mostly Chinese and that went over well. And then in 1971, I came to, as a young man, I came to Hawaii and I thought, wow, I got to give up Asian food because there's terrific <laughs> Asian food here. So that's when I went in back and started cooking Mexican food. So if I wanted to impress a woman in Hawaii, I cooked Mexican food. I stayed away from any type of trying to, uh, you know, impress them with Asian food. So and, and, and you and you were right to do the Mexican food because there's the there are a lot of Mexican restaurants, but quality Mexican restaurants are few and far between. I I only know of a couple that I would trust to go and 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 have a, uh, have some Mexican food. Yeah, and that's the, that's the whole interesting thing about it. So yeah, uh, I'm really impressed. And uh, so uh, talking about Asian food, you know, and uh, Pacific Island food. Uh, what are your favorites along those lines? What are things that you like to do in that area? Oh, well, cooking, uh, cooking something uh, Asian, uh, it's a, it's quite a, it's a much more precise cooking technique. There's a lot of uh, tradition and a lot of, a lot of um, procedure that goes into, you know, uh, you've heard the adage that the, uh, the sushi chefs. Uh, their first like three years, they're not even allowed to touch the rice, you know, <laughs> the, 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 the cooked rice. They're, they're only allowed to wash the rice and you have to learn how to wash it a certain way. And um, so like for, for me, going out to eat fresh quality sushi, I love. Um, I like to cook, I like my tempura. I like, um, you know, a good fish or a vegetable tempura. Um, and I make, uh, I used to do this in England, uh, Asia, this Asian dish. It's called okonomiyake, and it's um, a lot of julienne vegetables, you know, carrots and zucchini and squash and all kinds of other stuff and onions, and you mix it in with some flour and some egg, and then you cook them like little frittatas on the um, on a, a frying pan, uh -huh. and then you put like a mango chutney or something like that, and it was just it was it was healthy because it was all vegetables. Uh, it was yummy because you had that egg and flour and kind of like a like a uh, Call it a croquette like a croquette and uh, -huh. uh it just you know it was good it was it was quick food and it was easy to make and you like you could eat it and be knowing that you're getting your vegetables for the day i cook it for my son i sorry I trick him into eating vegetables <laughs> <laughs> that's the way to do it <laughs> they could find a way to make vegetables taste like candy kids would be healthy kids would be healthy <laughs> in this country that's great Jeremy, we're running uh, short on time. We're getting toward the end of the show. Uh, I told Jeremy at the beginning, I thought that uh, I would ask him about uh, if he was cooking for famous people today, if there was, he had a chance to cook for some famous people, what would he, uh, what would he cook for them? Uh, and who would he cook for? What famous food would he like to cook for? And uh, he gave me a very honest, uh, uh, straightforward answer, which I love. So maybe you can explain that to the audience. Yeah. Um, the first name that came to mind was Anthony Bourdain, obviously, because I, I, I mean, I, I had so much respect and, you know, he was in the trenches. He was, he wasn't one of these Hollywood chefs. He was in the trenches with the, with the boys and cooking. And so, so I, I, he's one of the ones I would have liked to invite, but I'll be totally honest with you. Guys like Ken, my wife, you know, close friends, those are the ones I like cooking for because I know that there's that that love that I share with my, with my friends. And I know that it comes back to me through the, through the reactions to the food that I present, present to them. 
Um, but if I was going to cook something like my absolute favorite dish in the world to cook is duck breast, uh, a really nice. And when we're in England, they have uh, Greshingham ducks, which are just beautiful, plump duck breasts. And I sear it. I, I finish it in the oven with some honey. I put it on a bed of Savoy cabbage with bacon and, and onions. Um, and and drizzle the honey over the the whole thing and it's just oh it's, it's really lovely nice medium rare duck breast um and the other thing i really love it's a nice it's a local dish something that i i learned from a uh from a friend here in hawaii and it's called pa'iai meatloaf so you have pa'iai which is your which is your um kalo that's been pounded and doesn't have as much of the moisture as the poi does so it's thicker and it's a, a little bit more viscous. And what I do is I put it in the fridge and it gets nice and solid. I cut it into cubes and I mix it in with a, a, a turkey meatloaf. So you, you, you just do turkey and a, a whole mess, probably about two pounds of just chopped up cubed vegetables and this pa'iai and you mix it in and you bake it and the pa'iai liquidizes inside of the meatloaf. So when you cut into it, it produces its own pa'iai gravy. It's just unreal. Um, so those are the two things that like are my favorite things to cook. And, and um, they, it's such a great reaction from the people eating it because they don't expect, like you don't cut into your meatloaf and go like, oh my gosh, there's gravy in the meatloaf. <laughs> and it's that pa'iai. And so it's healthy for you. It's, you know, so, so trying to transition from, really rich lush foods to things that are more simple things that are healthier for you that actually taste good and make you want to eat these healthier options wow that's terrific uh <laughs> you know in a time like this when there's so much uh negativity uh and one of the great one of the things that's been tragic about the uh, coronavirus is that uh we are less healthy because of that, because we go to the doctors less often uh, during the pandemic. Uh, we are not treating things as we should. And during this time, we desperately need to eat more healthy. And uh, that's just wonderful that you've, uh, you've sort of turned us onto that because, uh, you know, a lot of people, you say healthy food, they say, oh, you know. <laughs> uh, I just really appreciate all that and all your sharing, Jeremy. It's uh, it's been a wonderful session. I can see <clears throat> from my uh, Think Tech Hawaii clock that we're out of time, but uh, I want to thank you again for coming out, and I hope that we can see you sometime in the future again. It's been wonderful. What an absolute pleasure, Ken. Thank you so much for the invitation. And I want to thank, of course, uh, all, of, all of you who are out there looking, and I hope that uh, you've enjoyed this session with Jeremy. And uh, I also want to thank the Think Tech Hawaii staff. I want to thank uh, Jay and Haley and Michael and everybody for supporting us and uh, hope to see you in two weeks. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.